And now I would like to introduce our moderator this evening, Professor Marie Antidogi, Chair of both the UW and the Jackson School of Japan Studies programs. Dr. Antidogi is a professor in the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies and specializes in the political economy of Japan. She received her undergraduate master's and PhD degrees from the University of California, Berkeley. She currently holds the George Long Endowed Professorship as well. Her research is focused primarily on the key institutions and policies of Japan's capitalist systems. And she's currently researching the political economy of entrepreneurship, venture capital, and high tech startups in Japan. Her teaching and numerous publications reflect deep understanding and broad knowledge of the policies and institutions of Japan's political economic landscape. Please join me in welcoming Professor Antridogi. Thank you very much, Ellen, and thank you all for coming here tonight and also in the morning in Tokyo. It's a great honor to introduce Professor Takeo Hoshi of the University of Tokyo's Economics Department, where he just completed a term as Dean. Before returning to Tokyo, Professor Hoshi spent about 25 years in academia in the United States. He was first Pacific Economic Cooperation Professor in International Economic Relations at UC San Diego, and then Henry and Tomoye Kakahashi, Senior Fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford. He has written numerous sole and co-authored articles about the Japanese economy. I'll just mention a few. Uh, recently, Zombies Again, the COVID-19 Business Support Programs in Japan came out in the Journal of Banking and Finance. Before that, will the US and Europe avoid a lost decade? Lessons from Japan's post-crisis experience in the IMF Economic Review and zombie lending and depressed restructuring in Japan in American Economic Review. He's also written several books, um, including The Japanese Economy, co-written with Takatoshi Ito, The Political Economy of the Abe Administration and Abenomics Reform, which was co-edited with Philip Lipsy, and Corporate Financing and Governance in Japan, The Road to Future, to the Future, co-authored with economist Anil Kashyap. And this book received the Nikkei Award in 2002 for the best economics book. Professor Hoshi is also co-chairman of the academic board of the Center for Industrial Development and Environmental Governance at Tsinghua University in China and senior fellow at the Asian Bureau of Finance and Economic Research, which is based in Singapore. He also served as director of the Union Bankal, chair of the Board of Tokyo Foundation, and director of the Japan Investment Corporation. He's received many awards, including the 2015 Japanese Bankers Academic Research Prom Promotion Foundation Award, a 2011 Reischauer International Education Award from the Japan Society, a 2006 Enjoji Jiro Memorial Prize from Nihon Keizai Shimbun. In 2005, he received the Nakahara Prize from the Japan Economic Association. Professor Hoshi received his bachelor's degree uh, from the University of Tokyo and the PhD in economics from MIT. We are very lucky to have Professor Hoshi with us tonight. He's one of the very few economists I know that can really uh, talk to general audiences and uh, put things uh, into more simple language. So please join me in welcoming Professor Hoshi to the University of Washington for a talk about key challenges to the Japanese economy. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Mary, Professor Antrodoi, uh, for a very kind introduction. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, talk with you today at uh, or be between Seattle and Tokyo. 
So good evening and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me start by sharing the slide I prepared. And how am I doing with the slide? Does this look look okay? Yeah, good. Yeah, okay. looks good. So uh, I'd like to talk about what well, the, the topic I uh, prepared is titled Key Challenges to the Japanese Economy. And I regret to have uh, so wide a topic. There are lots of challenges to the Japanese economy and uh, no, nobody can cover all of these in 15 minutes. So I decided not to talk about the many key challenges, but focus on just two, okay? And one is the low economic growth in the last 30 years or so after the bubble burst at the end of 1980s or the beginning of 1990s. And then um, also mild but persistent deflation that continued at the same time with the low economic growth for uh, 20 to 30 years. And the focus of my talk today will be uh, monetary policy, which are important in explaining both. Uh, it, it not, that doesn't fully explain economic stagnation in Japan, but it has an important, the monetary policy has been an important part of the problems for J Japanese economic growth and, and also a persistent deflation. So I will be focusing on monetary policy today. And this is a great timing to uh, focus on monetary policy because the Bank of Japan just changed the governor. Uh, the governor Kuroda was uh, the governor of the Bank of Japan from 2012 to uh, 2012 or 2013? 2013 to 2023. And he stepped down uh, just about a month ago and uh, taken over by Professor Kazuo Ueda, who was a professor at the University of Tokyo uh, and also another university in, in Tokyo. But more importantly, he's a, an academic economist, and this is the first time the BOJ is headed by an academic economist. Uh, MIT PhD, uh, 10 years ahead of me. Uh, so uh, uh, this is a good timing to talk about the Japanese monetary policy and how it has been changing and what kind of uh, challenges the Japanese monetary policy and the BOJ faces today. And uh, we can speculate where uh, the Bank of Japan is moving to and what will happen to the Japanese economy. And let me start by uh, promoting a uh, book of mine, well, one of the books Mary mentioned. Uh, this is a textbook on the Japanese economy that I did with uh, Takatoshi Ito. And the uh, English version or the original version came out three years ago, 2020. But now the Chinese translation uh, was published late last year. And now the Japanese version uh, Japanese translation was published in March, a couple of months ago, just in time for the new academic year in Japan. So this, uh, th this textbook covers uh, many challenges that the Japanese economy, that the Japanese economy faces that I can't talk about today. So if you're seriously interested in uh, knowing more about the Japanese economy, I highly recommend uh, this book. And this book was published well, we finished this book uh, three years ago before the COVID started. So it's already a little bit out of date, uh, but uh, MIT Press uh, tells us that they want to see a little bit more sales before they let, let us uh, walk on the third edition. So uh, if you, you, can, you, you can help me on that as well. Okay, so coming back to the, today's topic, uh, I will be focusing on economic stagnation of Japan that many of you have heard, and the lack of inflation or, or deflationary pressure that the Japanese economy experienced in most of those uh, low stagnation periods. And this first slide was taken from uh, my book with Taka, uh, Figure 3.2 of the Japanese economy. And this shows uh, 
Japanese uh, growth rate, growth rate, real growth rate of the Japanese economy from 1955 to 2015. So this is a quick review of what happened in the Japanese economy in the last uh, half a century, a little bit more than a half a century. From 1955 to 1970, you, you can see the green line there, which is around 10% uh, of the uh, can I, can I use this? Okay. The 10% uh, or a little bit uh, below 10% a year annual growth. And uh, this it was a period of rapid economic growth, which some of you have heard. And then in the mid 1970s, the Japanese economy slowed down to around 4% growth and stayed there, stayed there until the end of 1980s. And back then, so, so this, this was a time I started uh, studying the Japanese economy and economics in, in general. And we talked about why the Japanese economy stopped growing and uh, growth grow slowed down. But then after the bubble burst in 1990s on, the Japanese economy, the growth rate of the Japanese economy dropped even further down to very close to zero and stayed there for 30 years or so. Okay. And uh, this is uh, another way to see the picture of the so-called lost two decades or three decades, depending on where you start. Um, green line shows the log level of GDP. Um, so it was growing in 1980s, but after the mid-1990s, so, so there was a bubble period, but after 1990s, mid 1990s, the economic growth slowed down. So the GDP becomes flatter. And this uh, lead line shows the trend line uh, of the log GDP from 1980 to 1996. So if the Japanese economy grew at the same at the constant rate, at the same rate as the 1980 to 1996 the Japanese economy would have followed this red line, which it didn't. So this shows a stagnation of the Japanese economy compared with what many people expected the Japanese economy to grow back in the 1980s. So this period after 1990s is called uh, lost two decades or three decades. Okay. And at the same time, Japan experienced um, falling price level or deflation. Okay, and this shows uh, inflation rate measured by a sub CPI inflation rate. And uh, a blue line is a headline CPI, which includes all the goods. And green line is, excludes the fresh food and energy. And this is what the BOJ focuses on currently. And either inflation rate regardless of the which inflation rate you look at, um, we see often, so this starts in 2006 and goes to today, but often we see the experience of a deflation. Uh, so this is uh, around 2010. Um, deflation rate was mostly mild, uh, around 1%. But nonetheless, it was persistent. Uh, it's a two, uh, I, I forgot to put uh, all your numbers to this, but the deflation really started around 1995 and continued to uh, almost today. Okay. And the things may be changing right now, uh, which, uh, we will come back, uh, which I will come back to, and that will be a focus of today's talk. Okay. So why Japan, um, why Japan experienced long time of economic stagnation and deflation? And uh, we can, or well, the simplest way to understand it, and uh, understand this, is to use a framework in simple macroeconomics, which talks about aggregate demand and aggregate supply. So the idea here is the economy can grow or economy can stagnate because of uh, two potential reasons. There may be not enough demand or 
there may not be enough uh, supply, or e even though there is uh, plenty of demand, but the capacity for the economy to produce may be constrained. So uh, for those, or, or uh, economy can have a problem on both sides, the demand and supply. And one of the key to understand uh, which one is more responsible, the demand side or supply side, is to look at what's happening in inflation or the price level. And roughly speaking, uh, and also we, we could uh, come up with a more detailed model, but uh, intuitively uh, we can understand why uh, looking at the price level or the inflation can help us tell which one is a problem, demand side or supply side. If the demand side is a problem, if the demand shortage is a problem, what we see will be that the price cannot go up. Uh, even though there are lots of goods, there is a shortage of demand, so the price level uh, stays the same or even fall. Uh, on the other hand, if the supply side is a problem, and uh, if there is a healthy demand, we would observe inflation. And what, what we observed for Japan is, of course, deflation. So that suggests the demand side was more important than the supply side. But at the same time, uh, we didn't observe uh, the deflation getting more serious and more, more, more serious and serious over time. Uh, what we saw was a persistent but a mild level of deflation. And this is something we wouldn't expect if the demand shortage was the only problem and the supply side or the production capacity of the economy continued to grow. If the supply side or the uh, production capacity of the economy continued to grow and the demand stagnate, what we would have observed is not the mild deflation, but the uh, deflation spiral, the deflation rate becoming lower and lower, or higher and higher, um, which wasn't the case for Japan. So what the Japanese case tells us, or most of the economists, is that there was a problem on both demand side and supply side, so the policy, if we needed to get out, if we wanted to get out of stagnation and deflation, uh, the policy needed to work on both demand side and supply side. And in a sense, this is what uh, Abenomics tried to do. Um, if you, if you have been around, or if you have been looking at the Japanese economy uh, for uh, more than ten years, uh, you remember uh, Abenomics. Uh, and uh, you remember three arrows, okay, which was a bold monetary policy, expansionary monetary policy, flexible fiscal policy, and the growth strategy to promote uh, private sector investment. And the first two tried to address the demand side, demand shortage, and the third one addressed or tried to address the supply side. So what really happened in Japan, or what happened in Japan is not so much the supply side continued to grow following this red line and the demand stagnated at the blue line. It's more like um, the, this uh, brown line uh, was the supply capacity. So, so the supply capacity, so, so the demand stagnated and that was more important than the supply side uh, suggested by deflation, but the supply side economy also suffered as well. So in order to recover the growth, uh, the Japanese economy or the, the policy should have focused on uh, both sides. And so uh, from that point of view, Abenomics, I guess, was in the right direction. And Abenomics succeeded in a sense, uh, well, well, at least tried to stimulate the economy. And uh, uh, showed a reasonable success in fixing the demand shortage. Um, I don't have the figures here, but we can see the output gap shrank. The, the, that is, uh, compared to the production capacity, the uh, economy's actual output uh, started to be very close. 
the unemployment rate fell and the labor market got very tight. And the deflation also, as we have seen in all your graph, the, in the Abenomics period, the deflation was, or inflation rate was mostly low, but in positive, positive region. Okay. We, we can ignore this inflation, increase in inflation in 2014 because that happened uh, because of the consumption uh, tax increase of uh, 3%. Okay. But there was a puzzle. Okay. And uh, deflation may have ended, but the inflation rate never reached the 2% target that the uh, Abenomics and the Kuroda BOJ stated. And this was the case even with the massive monetary stimulus. I just uh, increased the font size of massive. Uh, to show this was really large. And despite shrinking output gap and tightening labor market uh, and massive monetary stimulus, uh, prices nor wages increased. So uh, Japan seems to have been in, uh, in a sense, wage price spiral, that, but the spiral that never goes up. So it's like a wage price circle. The, because the prices do not rise, the firms um, cannot raise wages. Uh, and, and, but, but that's okay with workers because uh, prices do not rise. So they can be content without wage increases. So the firms uh, do not have to increase prices. And the circle continues. So the question is, or question for a naive economist is why? Uh, even with a tight labor market, uh, unemployment rate is low and many companies complain that they can't find the workers, why the wages did not increase and why the prices or, or, or why the firms were not pressured to increase their prices? And many people ask, this question, but uh, well, let, let, me, let me skip this. Uh, the, this slide just shows how massive the monetary expansion was. Okay. So many people ask this question, why the wages and the prices did not rise even with the tight labor market? And uh, I asked that question with uh, annual cash up two, and uh, this is uh, in the result appeared as a chapter in the book book on, on Abenomics that I edited with Philip Lipsy at a very kindly interview. And uh, th this is not uh, just uh, our idea. Uh, the, these ideas have been uh, ad uh, suggested by many economists uh, in, in Japan, especially labor economists, including uh, Yuji Genda, who's a very, very good labor economist, a colleague of mine at the University of Tokyo. But uh, uh, the key we focus on was, is the dual labor market nature of the Japanese economy. And may, some of you may have heard about the distinction between regular workers and part, regular workers and non-regular workers or full-time workers and part-time workers. I don't get into the fine distinction between regular versus full-time and non-regular versus part-time. But so, and I uh, use those uh, words interchangeably. But the key explanation is this. Um, uh, there, there, there are several factors or, or the two factors which made the Japanese wages uh, uh, J Japanese wages less sensitive to the labor market condition. And one is the excess or excessness or excessive uh, regular workers. And after the banking crisis in Japan, uh, many Japanese firms got into trouble, but they couldn't get rid of uh, old workers or, or the workers in, on lifetime employment. Uh, regular workers. So they started to express that uh, they see or they, they feel they have uh, excess workers. 
So that made um, the, their wages, wages of uh, no regular workers, disconnected from the labor market condition. E even though there is a, the labor market is tight, the labor market inside a firm for regular workers wasn't tight. And at the same time, uh, the Japanese firms increased the proportion of non-regular workers. They can't get rid of the regular workers, so they didn't want to hire regular workers. And instead, when they hire new workers, they hired as a part-time workers. Uh, the wages for those uh, non-regular workers as a part-time workers responded to labor market condition. This is something uh, we can see and uh, we show in our paper. But the level of wages for part-time workers were much lower and still are much lower than those for full-time workers. So even if we see an uh, increase in uh, part-time workers' wages, if the proportion of full-time workers who earn higher wages decline, uh, over time, uh, we tend to observe a lower average wage level because we have uh, more part-time workers who earn less, much less than the full-time workers, even if the low wages of uh, part-time workers increase a little bit because of the tight labor market. So these factors, these two factors, existed regular workers uh, and also an increasing proportion of part-time workers prevented the average wage from rising, even with the tight economy, tight labor market, and the massive uh, budgetary stimulus. And also, we, we show a relation between wage inflation and the price inflation also got weaker, but uh, I don't get into the details there. So, but in uh, 2022 and 2023, uh, the things may be changing. Um, the, the other many economies around the world, including Japan, are recovering from the COVID-19 recession. The inflation seems to be coming back, uh, even in Japan. So the left side of this uh, graph, left, 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 the, the graph on the left, shows the inflation rate, CPI inflation rate for uh, uh, four major economic areas, uh, Japan, EU, UK, and the US. And as we know, uh, in the US and the UK, and also in the EU, um, inflation has been increasing a lot. Uh, it, it seems to have, it may have stabilized, may have been stabilized a little bit, especially in the US. And uh, Japan was late, but the inflation rate is uh, coming up. Okay. And to respond to this, the many central banks, including the Federal Reserve, uh, or, or led by the Federal Reserve, has been raising interest rates. And this is something the Federal Reserve just did uh, this year, that, I mean, this week, too. But so far, the monetary policy hasn't changed for Japan. So inflation uh, seems to be coming back even in Japan. So the long period of uh, deflation or uh, wage, Japanese type of wage price spiral, the zero inflation, the zero wage inflation promotes uh, zero price inflation, vice versa, seems to be or may be ending. And if that's the case, eventually the BOJ may have to be pressured to increase the interest rate in order to um, prevent inflation from uh, getting even higher. So it's around 4% or 3% or if you look at the core inflation rate, excluding fresh food, excluding fresh food and energy price. Okay. Um, as I said, the 
Bank of Japan changed the governor, and the uh, new governor, Kazuo Ueda, uh, under the new governor, the BOJ just met uh, last week, and uh, they decided uh, the or they, they decided on the monetary policy. And uh, some people expected, or may, many people uh, was uh, was curious what the uh, governor Ueda, Ueda and the new BOJ would do uh, during the first monetary policy meeting. The result was that they decided not to really change the monetary policy from an uh, earlier regime. So they decided to continue quantitative and qualitative monetary easing. That's a name for the uh, monetary policy stance uh, with yield curve control. So the following the QQE policy, um, they continue to expand the monetary base until the CPI increase, CPI inflation rate exceeds 2% and stays above that target in a stable manner. Uh, as we saw earlier, and uh, it, some, some people may have noticed, the Japanese CPI inflation rate in, uh, uh, for all items less fresh food uh, is already exceeding 2%. Okay, but the BOJ thinks, or the BOJ's official position is uh, if it's not staying, or if it's not expected to stay, above the target in a stable manner. So they continue uh, QQE at this point, they continue to expand the monetary base. Also, they set the interest rate, uh, short-term interest rate to be negative. So they charge a negative interest rate on some of the deposit that the commercial banks have at the Bank of Japan. So uh, they want to give an incentive for uh, incentive for the uh, the commercial banks not to hold on to a uh, lot of money or a lot of uh, funds. And at the same time, they also want to hold down the long term uh, long term interest rate as well as well in order to stimulate the economy. And this is a so, so the YCC consists of uh, two things. They uh, hold the short-term interest rate low, and uh, they hold, also hold long-term interest rate at some level, and continue to uh, pressure down the yield curve. Yield curve. So it's called. It's that, that's what it's called. Uh, yield curve control, and uh, they continue to limit uh, ten-year JGB yields the interest rate, 10 year interest rate on 10 year government bonds around 0%, plus minus 0.5 percentage points. So they allow the interest rate, long-term interest rate to fluctuate a little bit by the market forces, but not too much. This range uh, plus minus 0.5 percentage point used to be 0.25, percent until the end of last year, 2022, and the BOJ just changed um, at the end of last year to expand the range of 10-year uh, JGB yields. So many people thought that was the start of a change in YCC, but at this time, the BOJ didn't uh, change or didn't increase the range as some people suspected. And, they, uh, and the BOJ continue to purchase assets and uh, make the BOJ balance sheet bigger. So, so this is something uh, Federal Reserve did uh, when they were expanding the monetary policy following the global financial crisis and also uh, global financial crisis until the economy recovered. Uh, Bank of Japan still continues this uh, expansionary monetary policy by buying up uh, many assets. Okay. Now, the as I said, the many countries uh, have been raising the interest rate 
And but uh, BOJ has been um, continuing the the expansionary monetary policy, even though uh, the Jap the, even though the Japanese economy seems to be experiencing inflation as well, although the inflation rate so far has not been as high as the inflation rate in the US or uh, in Europe. So the BOJ um, is in a difficult situation on how to continue. So, so far, the BOJ is continuing um, monetary, the very expansionary monetary policy, but there is a risk of doing that as well. So uh, the, from the BOJ point of view, uh, they want to avoid two possibilities, two extreme possibilities. The one is the risk, there is a risk of continuing um, extraordinarily expansionary monetary policy, which is a current policy, setting the negative interest rate and holding the long-term interest rate to around 0%. Well, of course, the possibility or the risk of uh, following that, uh, the continuing that policy, even when the inflation rate started to come up, is the inflation rate goes even higher. And uh, the, 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 this is something uh, we we already seeing that because the BOJ has been uh, setting the interest rate low compared with uh, other countries, the yen depreciated. Um, but eventually, um, if the inflation continues to go up, uh, the BOJ eventually will need to tighten monetary policy drastically. And in, in a sense, this is what the Federal Reserve had to do last year and uh, eventually create eventually create recession or uh, instability in the financial system, in the banking system, which is the US is uh, experiencing now. So there is a danger of a too late normalization. But on the other hand, uh, Bank of Japan thinks there is a risk on the other side as well. Uh, the other side is uh, raising interest rate or exiting, e exiting from uh, uh, unconventional monetary policy or extraordinarily expansionary monetary policy too soon. And in a sense, uh, the BOJ has a track record of uh, doing this. Uh, I don't get into the detail today, but you can read our textbook. In August of 2000, um, Bank of Japan, uh, back then, the Bank of Japan was already doing a zero interest rate policy. They deviated or they terminated the zero interest rate policy a little bit because they thought uh, the economy was recovering, but the economy got back into recession after that, and the Bank of Japan had to go back to zero interest rate policy and quantitative easing. Uh, 2006, this is more debatable. Uh, the Bank of Japan stopped the quantitative easing in 2006. Um, some people think uh, that was the right timing. Uh, some other people, including myself, think uh, that was a too uh, uh, th th that was also a premature, uh, and the uh, Japanese economy got got into a recession again. And of course, in the 2008 or 2007, 2008 was the start of global financial crisis. So it's hard to tell uh, how much the monetary policy decision was responsible for the downturn in 2008, 2009. Okay. So there is a danger the the BOJ feels that uh, if they stop the extraordinary expansionary monetary policy now, um, the economy can get back into stagnation and even deflation. So there is a danger of too early normalization. Um, there is, of course, a possibility for the BOJ to get this right. Okay, so uh, continue the extraordinary 
expansionary monetary policy for now. Uh, but uh, exit from that at the, or normalize at the right moment so that the economy reaches the 2% inflation target and the uh, economy continues to grow. Uh, that seems to be, if you look at the report of the BOJ, so, so this is an outlook for economic activity and the prices that the BOJ published at the same time they decided on the current monetary policy uh, in April uh, last week. This shows the inflation rate, expected inflation rate of CPI, all items less fresh food, according to the BOJ policy board members. So these are each point represents the policy, uh, the inflation expectation by a policy board member. Okay. The point estimate. And if you look at the point estimate, uh, they are expecting, so in 2022, uh, as we saw, the actual inflation rate was above 2%. But they're expecting the inflation to come back to around 2%. Okay, so in that sense, the BOJ seems to be uh, thinking that uh, they, 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 get this, they can get this exactly right and the economy can converge in 2% uh, inflation rate, which is their target. Okay, but in a sense, this. Um, um, this figure is, can be mis, misleading in the sense that this doesn't represent a uh, risk assessment of uh, policy board members very much. There, there's actually, they try to show this by uh, using a white triangle and uh, a black triangle, which is uh, probably too small to see on your screen. So I, I, I don't get into that. Um, so that is, so if you look at um, more details of the explanation of, of this report, uh, they can see the many BOJ board members and the BOJ sees there is a substantial possibility that the inflation can actually go up there or come down here. Okay. So these are point estimate of a 2% inflation is not tight in, in, in that sense. Okay. And this is actually, or this, this is what the BOJ actually said. Okay. The BOJ or concerning risk to the outlook, there are extremely high uncertainty. And uh, and going going down to another place that I bolded, risks to prices are skewed to the upside for fiscal 2023. So they worry more about too high inflation in 2023, but skewed to the downside for fiscal 2025. But eventually, they put more uh, more weight on low inflation scenario. So seemingly consistent with uh, our, our record, the Japan, unlike other countries, had a hard time achieving inflation, hard time uh, getting far away from a deflationary period. So it's understandable, it seems understandable that the BOJ worry more about the downside and in a sense less about the upside, or and it's not quite upside, but the high inflation possibility. Okay. But the one thing we need to think about is the Japanese labor market seems to be already changing, and the Japanese wages seems to be now responding more to the labor market condition. Okay, unlike uh, what was the case in 2000 or 1990s. And we can see this by looking at uh, one factor that tends to uh, reduce the wages in Japan, that is uh, increasing 
number or increasing proportion of the part-time workers. And this is a proportion of part-time workers uh, for uh, every year from 1990 to 2022. And as we can see, the part-time workers, the proportion of part-time workers increased over time. But after the mid-2010, actually, this ratio has stabilized. So uh, if both the part-time workers' wage and full-time workers' wage start to increase, uh, the average wage would also uh, increase as well. Okay, so the it's not it's more likely that wages can respond to economic condition and the other thing is uh, this is a proportion th th this is a measure of excessness of the full-time workers or regular workers and uh, oh I, I forgot to change uh, japanese into uh, english but the uh, red line is for regular workers uh, and uh, blue line, or let's see, uh, or red line is for normal workers, which is pretty close to regular workers, and the blue line is for regular workers. It, that doesn't matter anyway. And this is a proportion of uh, companies which says uh, they have excess workers, um, and that uh, tend to be uh, quite quite high, it fluctuates, but uh, tend to be high from the 1990s to mid-2010, but the uh, excessness of the full-time workers seems to have disappeared uh, in mid-2000. Okay. And uh, it went up a little bit during the COVID crisis, but the interesting thing is uh, in COVID, uh, the excessness of the workers increased or excessive workers increased for both full-time workers and part-time workers. So if we look at the difference between the excessness of the full-time workers and part-time workers, then we don't see any difference between full-time workers and part-time workers. And before that, the phenomena of excessive workers only applied for full-time workers. So the things are changing. And uh, already the wages have been rising even before the COVID, if you look at the average wage. And I guess th this figure is easier to see. So this shows a wage for full-time workers and part-time workers separately. And the average is a blue line. And the average wage and full-time uh, workers' wage is uh, measured on the left-hand side. And the part-time workers' wages are measured on the right axis. Okay, so the numbers are much lower for the part-time workers than the full-time workers. And this is a nominal term. So what this shows is the average wage in nominal term didn't change for 15 years or so. Uh, Part-time workers' wage increased over time, and, and the full-time because of and, and this is because the the constant wage was there because the full-time workers' wage didn't grow, and as I said, the e proportion of part-time workers increased, so the average wage kept low, but that started to increase uh, starting right before the COVID. So it's possible. So, so there, there have been an important changes in the labor market. And so the average wages are likely to rise when the labor market is high. So it's possible that uh, uh, BOJ or the Japanese economy uh, is, uh, uh, is going to, or, or there is a danger that the Japanese economy experiences too high inflation rather than too low inflation. And one of the key things to look at is uh, what's going on in the annual wage negotiation between labor unions in Japan and the management called Shinto, or Spring Wage Negotiation. 
And uh, there, there is a mention of that in the BOJ report, but uh, this figure is probably easier to look at. Uh, this is uh, taken from uh, Rengo's press release. Rengo is an uh, association of the labor unions in Japan. And uh, this shows the uh, wage increase of uh, spring wage negotiation uh, for average worker and the workers and SME separately. And it doesn't matter which one you look at. In, tw in the numbers for it is for the June every year, except for uh, this year's number, in, which is in April. So this number is much higher than the wage increase in the last uh, 20 years. And in fact, the, we are experiencing or we are observing the weight, largest wage increase in 30 years. So the wages seem to be, uh, pick, or wages are picking up. And this can create uh, a different type of a wage price dynamics in Japan. So uh, there is a danger that uh, wage increase continues, which fuels the price increase, and that leads to a higher wage increase and create a high inflation, higher inflation than 2%. So, um, so it's a judgment call, the, but the BOJ um, thinks the low inflation scenario is something, the risk of too low inflation, inflation is something we need to worry about more for Japan. So they decided to continue the current uh, expansionary monetary policy. But the change in the labor market and also that the, 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 that is observed um, and uh, what's been happening with uh, Shinto this year uh, would make someone worry more about high inflation or too high inflation in Japan. And or the Japan may go back to, or, or the Japan may converge to just the right level of inflation of a 2% target. Either way, if we can, uh, if we don't go, if Japan doesn't go back to a low inflation or a deflationary period, then eventually the BOJ uh, have to raise the interest rate. It may happen orderly in an orderly normalization, or it may be pressure to increase the interest rate much faster than they thought as the Federal Reserve had to do last year. So, but, but either case, the normalization of monetary policy, which means higher interest rate than zero or negative, uh, will happen sooner or later. And uh, then the important thing for uh, the Japanese economy the BO, which includes the BOJ uh, and also the government, is to make sure when the, uh, the Bank of Japan has to raise the interest rate, has to normalize the monetary policy, um, they have to, or they want to make sure uh, some instability in the financial system uh, doesn't happen. And here, uh, one thing we really need to worry about is the situation in the government debt market. And uh, the many people, including myself, have been worrying about the sustainability of the Japanese government debt for a long time. And so far, there haven't been any problems. The Japan continue to issue uh, the government, increase the amount of government debt and uh, Japan just did that, uh, well, J Japan did that in the COVID to respond to the, the pandemic, which is what many countries did. And also, th th this is again what many countries are doing, but uh, Japan uh, again decided to uh, expand the government expenditure, especially in the area of uh, defense, 
green transformation, and also they talk about uh, the uh, the policies to increase the birth rate in Japan. So the sustainability or the unsustainability of the government debt uh, will emerge as a more one of the most serious concerns if the Bank of Japan has to raise the interest rate in the near future. So let me end by looking at uh, how the interest rate is related to the government debt uh, or the sustainability of the government debt. So on the, right, on the left side of the graph, this shows the government forecast of the government debt to GDP ratio uh, according, to the gov uh, according to the government calculation. And uh, this shows the timing of the projection. So in 2012, 2014, and back in 2012, uh, we worry about the, the government debt increase a lot. And uh, th this shows uh, back in 2012, in the baseline case, if the growth didn't recover, the Japanese government was expo expecting the exploding the government debt. But over time, the government, the prediction of the government debt looked more benign. And the only reason is uh, they were able to adjust the path of infl interest rate. So, which is shown on the right hand side. They have been uh, adjusting the path for the future interest rate down, reflecting the declining interest rate in the market. But the things started to change uh, in, uh, to, or maybe the things are changing in uh, 2012. So, from uh, 2018 to 2012, the interest rate projection continues to go down. But in 2023, so, so this is a January projection compared with the July, 20, uh, Ju July projection of the last year, the government had to raise the interest rate. Okay. But still, it's much lower than what they expected in 2018 and only considers uh, interest rate increases to a little bit less than 1% by, uh, as of uh, two, uh, 2032. So if the interest rate got much higher than, th than this, uh, the government debt sustainability will become a problem. And even with, a benign, even with a relatively low interest rate, relatively small interest rate increase, the, in the baseline case, the government debt is marginally sustainable. It starts to increase a little bit. So with a higher interest rate of, uh, say, even 2%, uh, the, there will be a serious danger. So, so that's uh, another thing the BOJ need to worry about. So, so wrapping up, um, the or Japan uh, suffered from uh, deflation for a long time, but the situation seems to be changing. And uh, Japan faces uh, two side risk, high, the risk of too high inflation and the risk of uh, too low inflation again. And the BOJ seems to put more weight on low inflation scenario and wants to continue the expansion of, or continue expansionary monetary policy. But we probably need to worry uh, about the high inflation scenario as well. And in that case, uh, we really need to worry about the government debt situation. in Japan. So uh, let, me, let me stop here. And I guess uh, there, there are some questions. Well, thank you uh, very much, Takeo. Um, all of you, please start putting questions in the box. I wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit.